So good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the 28th Military Rider Symposium. My name is Dr. Travis Morris, and I have the privilege and honor of being the director for Norwich University's Peace and War Center, as well as the executive director for the Military Rider Symposium. We're, we're glad that you're here. And for those of you, this, if this is your first session of the day, if you would permit me, let me just discuss about what's transpired and then what's going to happen over the next couple of days. So this morning, we started off with our keynote. We had the Israeli ambassador on campus speaking about the intersection of artificial intelligence, robotics, and, and security, particularly between nation states. And then we also had John Abele, who is the founder and director of Boston Scientific. And I will say, if you're not familiar with Boston Scientific, you should Google that. We're thrilled and honored to, to have him here. We've had sessions that look at the intersection between science fiction and robotics and what that means. And then we also had a session from August Cole, and uh, he is one of our globe's leading futurists. Both him and his co-author, Peter Singer, have written books that have been read around the globe in multiple different languages. So the Military Writers Symposium, it's the only event of its kind in the United States. And our charge, what we've been doing for 28 years, is to select topics that are a relevant security concern for the 21st century. Last year, we focused on the Arctic. Before that, we focused on the weaponization of water. And this year, we're focused on the intersection of artificial intelligence and robotics. And for the students that are in the room, whether you're here because a class is here, AI and robotics impacts your life, whether you recognize it or not. If you have a cell phone, the world in which you live in is centered on AI and what that means, both positive and negative. That's why we're here having this discussion over the next couple of days. This is a team effort, and what does that mean? That means that in order to adequately discuss this topic, we brought in subject matter experts to help us think through this security issue and just event in general from multiple different angles. And for the students in the room, particularly those that are, are going to serve in some sort of capacity, either security, defense, law enforcement, policy, you need to recognize that this is the world in which you're going to be living in, in which we already are living in. And the topics and things that some of us here are imagining, it's the world in which you are going to operate. You're going to be making decisions, and you're going to be leading. It's important, and that's why you're here. That's why the symposium exists, and that's why we're having this discussion over the next couple of days. Outside in the lobby, there's a program. Make sure you take a look at the program. And if you see, there's three other reports that are there. Those are done by your peers. Those are research that's done by student fellows that have been associated with the Military Writer Symposium. It wasn't done by staff. It wasn't done by faculty. Those are done by your peers. It's important to know what your peers are sometimes thinking about and doing and just some of the things that are available for you on, on campus. And one of the things that Norch has been doing for 200 years plus We've been trying to think about what's next, what's ahead, and how to prepare you to lead through that. And this is what's on the docket for you. And if you're thinking that cyber or AI is not part of something you should be thinking about, it doesn't matter your major, it certainly is. And that's why we're here today. And we're thrilled that you're here, but also we're thrilled that our guests are here. So one of the things we do at Norwich is we try and include students in all that we do. This goes back to our beginning. This is what Partridge did as he marched them around the Green Mountains and the White Mountains. Now we do that digitally, and we do that overseas, and we want student voices to be heard. And the other thing I just want to make sure that we all realize is even though we're having this discussion today in English, this discussion is being held across the globe in multiple different languages, from Spanish to Japanese to Korean to Arabic, to Swahili, and also to English and to German. It's a global conversation. We've had some students read uh, some of their essays in another language. So we've had Ukrainian, and we're going to have uh, some others over the next couple of days. But we've also had some students that have written some pieces to talk about uh, their reflections on security. One of the things also to recognize is when we're talking about AI and robotics, it does involve cross-cultural competencies. And so it's not something that is, is irrelevant. We should be talking about uh, thinking cross-culturally. But we also should talk about the psychology of AI. How does that impact with your emotions? What happens when you have robots and artificial intelligence that can read your emotions better than you, and they also portray emotions? 
And, and part of those emotions, we know from our veterans, have to deal with trauma. And trauma has to deal with PTSD. And so when we're talking about these variables, we definitely want you to know that uh, AI is not just about programming. It's not something that's always just about science fiction. It's not something that's about the DOD. It involves a wide spectrum of disciplines and conversations. So we're gonna ask our, our, our student reader today to come on up and share his reflections. And then after that, I'll turn it over to the moderator for our panel today. The floor is yours. So good afternoon to everybody who is here in person and online. Uh, first and foremost, I'm going to thank my parents who have always helped me with my writing career. And without further ado, here's my piece entitled Coming Back. His hands couldn't stop shaking. The ring of battle had long since ceased to thrum in his ears, leaving him calm but not at peace. He was fine. More than fine, he was alive. That was more than half his squad could say. If only his hands would stop shaking. He thought back to all the seminars, the words of wisdom, the briefs meant to prepare him for the vital moments his life would rest in his hands so like the rifle that took more of his life with each shot fired. And with every hand clapped on his shoulder, he'd believed more and more that it was possible to get through this unscathed. And he had, right? The words of every combat veteran who'd warned him flooded the panic that could no longer threaten him. In a span of minutes, he had come to understand combat was the easy part. Coming home, pretending that everything was okay, smiling at the loving wife and the neighbors who'd encouraged him to give the enemy what was coming to him as if they had a clue that was the hard part. How was he supposed to go back to watching ball games with his friends after firing rounds into flesh? How was he supposed to watch his daughter in her Christmas play when he saw dead friends waving from the wings. Plenty of people came back from this. He knew that. He could do it. And didn't he owe it to the friends who couldn't make it back from this, the ones who would never get the chance? He would, he promised himself, if only his hands would stop shaking. Thank you. So a question to you in the future. Is it possible that that could be from some sort of robotic perspective? Don't know, right? 100 years from now, 200 years, we don't know. But this, these are some of the things that we're, we're, we're thinking about. So it's my honor and privilege to turn the floor over to Dr. Brian Bragge, Spotlight Labs. Welcome back to Norwich. Thank you so much for taking the time to, to be here. And sir, the floor is yours. Hey, thanks, Travis. I appreciate that. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Dr. Brian Bradke. As uh, Travis saluted the, with the welcome back, uh, I was uh, faculty here in mechanical engineering for six years. Uh, and I, I truly miss it. It's nice to see uh, some of my colleagues. Uh, good to see you again. And if any of my students are still sitting in the audience, I'm sorry that you couldn't get out in four years. Um, <laughs> hopefully, there's not any. I haven't seen them yet. Uh, it is my uh, privilege to be moderating this panel. Uh, my background. Uh, you know, apart from um, Norwich, uh, I left Norwich to join Spotlight Labs, and we are a company that is building biomedical sensors, systems, and algorithms to bridge the man-machine gap. And that is, how do we bring the, uh, the physical machine and the, in this case, the soldier together to be a more effective, uh, more effective fighting force? Um, as a part of that work, we're sponsored by DARPA, and uh, that leads us into the topic for today's panel, called Secret Science, DARPA, and Unimagined Technologies. Uh, and I have the distinct privilege of introducing Sharon Weinberger, who's joining us from the Wall Street Journal. Uh, she is the Wall Street Journal's national security and foreign policy editor. Previously, she was the Washington, D.C. bureau chief for Yahoo News. Prior to that, she was an executive editor at Foreign Policy Magazine and earlier the national security editor at The Intercept. Her third book, published in 2017, is called The Imagineers of War, The Untold Story of DARPA, the Pentagon Agency that Changed the World. And so today, what I'd like to do is, uh, originally, Sharon was going to open with some comments, but I think we just want to jump right into a uh, discussion. And uh, I have a few canned questions here, but I'd like to invite uh, our guests here in the audience, if you've got questions, to uh, please come down to the uh, microphone. 
uh, and participate in the discussion because that's a, a lot more uh, engaging and I think a lot more interesting and it certainly keeps us on our toes. Uh, but ultimately, we want to uh, discuss the things that you're interested in as well as talking about the things that we're interested in. So I will get started. Uh, I read a little bit of your book uh, called The Imagineers of War. Uh, and uh, DARPA, which actually started as ARPA, uh, originally got a start after Sputnik in the space race, uh, and then after they uh, had, had sort of handed off the responsibilities to NACA, then NASA, they almost went extinct. Uh, but they found a way to maintain relevance, and I was wondering if you could talk about what it was like in the early days at DARPA, and kind of how did they, wh where did they get their start? sentence, oh, much better, that said, you know, this, this, this agency will do those projects as directed by the Secretary of Defense, which were initially in the space race. Um, so within a year, that was successful. We actually weren't that far behind the Soviet Union. We launched the first satellite. Um, that we, we launched the U.S.'s first satellite into space. And then very quickly, in, this is one of the reasons I call it an untold history, this new agency lost its mission. The space programs, the military space programs were taken back by the military services, and the civilian space programs went to the newly formed NASA. So you suddenly have this agency without a clear mission. It had some sort of leftover programs. And it had a very ambitious official there who kind of looked at how they could use this new agency and saw a brewing conflict in Vietnam. Um, not a part of history we hear about today when we think about DARPA as this Pentagon agency that invented the internet stealth aircraft drones. But in fact, um, from the early 1960s to the early 1970s, one of the biggest growing, one of the basically the biggest and high profile mission area that, that DARPA was involved in was the war in Vietnam. At one point it had, um, it had several hundred personnel um, located in both Vietnam and in Thailand uh, trying to come up with counterinsurgency technologies. Um, and so it was involved in that fight in, in Vietnam as sort of the deployed counterinsurgency agency, deployed counterinsurgency agency for the better part of 10 years. Um, and in fact, getting to the theme of today's conference, some of the work that we most associate with DARPA today, like drones, came out of their work in Vietnam. To some extent, um, even computer networking, uh, the internet came out of the early work that DARPA did in Vietnam, working with computers to come up with, to help with targeting um, along the Ho Chi Minh Trail. So a lot of what we associate with DARPA today actually came from counterinsurgency. And it's kind of an interesting inflection point here where as a nation, we're coming out of 20 years of insurgency and counterinsurgency work and pivoting back towards great power competition. When the, when the US came out of Vietnam in the early 1970s, DARPA had to rethink its strategy. How do we take these um, technologies that we developed for counterinsurgency and make them relevant for the battle against the Soviet Union? I think one of the challenges that is facing probably scientists and technologists who work in and for the Pentagon today is how do you take that 20 years of work on counterinsurgency and make it relevant for this pivot that we're making back to great power competition? Um, when it comes to robotics and artificial intelligence, one of the reasons I was so interested in DARPA was to ask a question, which is, you know, we often consider it one of the most successful research agencies, certainly most successful military uh, research agencies around is what makes it successful. I think one of the things I came out of interviews for the book thinking was, you know, th there's really two questions to ask. Um, what, is the, um, what is the national security problem you're trying to solve? Um, and is that an important problem? There's lots of problems you can solve that are small problems. And is the solution you're proposing going to actually solve that problem? Um, so those are kind of, kind of the, the biggest lesson I took away from interviewing DARPA researchers. 
Yeah, and, and so th thanks for the historical context. Um, fast forward now, you know, 50 years to today, um, has there been a great evolution or change in the way that DARPA operates? Or I guess what is their, is, do they still have the same uh, mission or kind of strategic impl implications? They have the same fundamental mission. I think there's a lot of mythology around the agency. So it's known, I mean, to give you kind of the, the thumbnail sketch of what DARPA is today, it's um, an approximately $4 billion agency. It has 160-some um, technical personnel, usually program managers, who come in to run programs for limited periods of time, usually anywhere between two and five years in general. You know, there's always exceptions to the rule. And it is project-based. So um, they will start a project, do it to the completion or failure, and then it is up to usually a military service or some other place to kind of do something with it. Uh, what was so interesting about the research is back in, if you look back in the archives, in 1958, uh, the entire personnel of DARPA was on like a, 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 you know, a notebook card, an index card like you have there. Um, today, there is, um, or at least there was, I don't think they actually printed anymore, a phone book of DARPA personnel because it's not just these 160 technical personnel, it's also support workers around them. So it, it is still a much more nimble agency than other parts of the Pentagon. Um, what they often like to say is we have the freedom to fail. Um, you don't learn unless you can fail. Um, they certainly have um, you know, more ability to move money around, but they aren't quite as small and agile as they like to believe or as they once were. And I think that's actually one of the biggest problems that they're facing today is, you know, how, how big should the agency be? How much money should they spend? Um, I think the other major change that we've seen, and this is one where I get a lot of criticism sometimes from current people in DARPA, and I, I'm happy to hear that criticism, but I can only say I, you know, the research I did was the research I did. They have a lot less access to the senior leadership of the Pentagon that they once did. You know, back in these early days of 1958, DARPA was located, you know, just on the same corridor in the E-ring of the Pentagon as the Secretary of Defense. They were getting taskings directly from the President, directly from the Secretary of Defense. Um, so, for instance, you know, speaking to uh, robotics, artificial intelligence, so ARPANET, which was the predecessor to the Internet, came out of some direct taskings from Pentagon senior leadership in some ways. Now, you know, DARPA sits in a very nice building in Northern Virginia. Certainly the director has communications with senior defense officials, but I don't think they have quite that connection. So what, what happens when you're sort of separate from the Pentagon leadership? Well, in one case, you have, you have more freedom. You can do interesting projects. On the other hand, you know, if you don't, know what the major national security problems that senior leaders are facing, whether it's in the Pentagon or the White House, you're sort of defining them on your own. And I would argue, and I think that I've had pushback to that argument, that the problems they're trying to solve today um, are often less important. And I know that sounds terrible, and I'm, I'm a big fan of the work the agency has done. So when we take it back to the early days, they were trying to get us into space. That was the number one thing in 1958. They were trying to, you know, they were trying to win the Vietnam War. Um, it certainly was what I think one um, DARPA director called a glorious failure. And what he meant was, yes, it was a failure, but it, it was glorious in, in, in terms of its ambitions. Um, I think DARPA works on you know, very good problems now. It does very good work. I think it is perhaps less ambitious than it once was. Those are the changes. Yeah, thank you. Um, so working in, uh, you know, as a small business uh, owner and, and, and bringing products to market, um, I noticed a stark difference between how private markets do innovation and funding and you know, seed capital and, and investment, um, you know, venture capital. And they seem to have an attitude of uh, take, make a lot of small bets, knowing that 90% of them are going to fail, and let the let the few uh, really good ideas kind of flourish and turn into you know products, companies, etc. Um, over the last few years, we've seen the Department of Defense try and do the same thing with the Defense Innovation Units and the AFWorks and the you know these other kind of things. Um, 
has DARPA been successful at, at doing that same kind of model? Are they trying to adopt more of a kind of a private equity model, or are they sticking to more of the bureaucratic uh, government model? So what DARPA has long argued is exactly that, that, you know, I, I forget the, the exact percentages they use. You know, if 90% if of our projects fail, but that 10% or even that 1% is the internet, you know, ARPANET, which led to the internet, or it is stealth aircraft, then that success, that big success, makes up for all the failures. Well, there, there's, a, and I think that's a good philosophy. And so, so DARPA will often, DARPA leadership often doesn't like to be compared to these or other organizations. They kind of look at them as encroaching on their territory. I think one DARPA director told, told me, you know, we've always worked with Silicon Valley. You know, we don't need all of these other new agencies. And, and that's, that's a, it's an interesting argument. Um, and I, you know, I think they may have some points there. Um, but the, the, the things that I always point out is it's important. Um, the other thing that DARPA often likes to say is we don't remember the failures. <laughs> and that's very dangerous. And what they mean by that is, you know, because they want to be able to try, you know, like hypersonics. You've failed 10 times, but the 11th time will be a success. My counter argument to that is often it's really important to know why you failed before so you don't make the same mistake. Um, uh, you know, one of the stories I sometimes relate, and so, yeah, it's important to know why something fails, and this goes in a little bit to the area you work in. Back in the um, early 1970s, uh, the CIA asked DARPA, the CIA was funding um, psychics and parapsychology, you know, the idea you had people with ESP powers, you could sit in a room and imagine a Soviet sub base and draw it. Anyway, the CIA was very excited about this work, so they invited the DARPA director over to brief him on it, and he will DARPA take a look and maybe get involved in funding it? And so they sent this program manager out, um, George Lawrence, who had been one of the originators of research in US government for biofeedback. Um, uh, the idea that you, actually you probably could probably just that you have sensors that give information that can feed back to the person. I'll actually let you talk about that a little bit. And you know, they kind of, in the 1970s, this was kind of considered a hippy dippy area. So they were like, who better to send out than George, who kind of is in these hippy dippy areas, and he can go meet the psychics. So he, he went out to view this CIA funded work, actually out in Silicon Valley at SRI, the old Stanford Research Institute, where a couple um, of scientists there were doing work with psychics, including Yuri Geller, who people of a certain age will remember from the Johnny Carson show, Spent uh, Bending Spoons. Anyway, George went out, took a look at this work, pretty quickly decided it was, you know, Yuri was a showman and a magician. Yuri still says he helped the CIA, but I'll let that debate just be out there. Um, and, and, and came back and kind of reported, like, yeah, it'd be very nice to imagine Soviet bases, but this isn't the way he could do you could do it, but actually what, what George took out of that was another program saying, okay, suppose you could move things with your brain. How do we actually do that? And from biofeedback, he then originated sort of the US government research program in brain computer interface, which some of you may be more, I mean, this is, you know, five decades ago. We're still not there yet, but you have people like Elon Musk with Neuralink trying to link the human brain with machines. Can you have sensors, whether on the head or implanted that will help you move a computer cursor, a device. I think the way they imagined it back in the early 1970s at DARPA was you would be able to operate an aircraft with your mind. I, that, that's gonna be a ways away. But the point being, you know, there are, um, it's important, <laughs> you know, if you want brain computer interface, I'm gonna say that computers are probably gonna be a more successful route to that than the psychics. Um, so knowing why something works and making it scientific is, in, you know, knowing that, that if you want that 1% to succeed, Choose the right programs. Yeah, absolutely, and that, that that is a challenge, right? Is how do you how do you have the foresight to look at a fledgling program and decide whether or not it, it could be successful, and then uh, ultimately whether or not to fund it and to continue to support it, uh, so that ultimately it does become successful in transition, and that that's a struggle too. So uh, you're absolutely right. Um, and in, in terms of you know emerging technology, so I know that I know the title of this panel is Secret Science, and I know. Everybody would love to know about all the secrets that we have going on. I'm sure, I know there's at least one UFO pilot in the audience, I, I don't see him here, but there is one. Um, and you can, you can find him after and ask him about doing that. Um, but when it comes to DARPA and everybody has these ideas that they're working on this just incredible technology that's way out in the future and we haven't even thought of it yet. Uh, what do you see as coming next? What, where, do you think, where do you think the state of defense innovation 
um, and technology is ultimately going to go? Is it propulsion? Is it aircraft? Is it, uh, is it just AI robots that can go fight our wars for us? What do you see as, you know, from your experience as, uh, as coming next? You know, I think what has been a big focus of DARPA and now the Defense Department writ large has been hypersonics. Um, I, I've uh, often, you know, I, I guess I've interviewed a lot of skeptics over the years about how useful they can be, but I've also seen some convincing arguments in recent years. I think that is where you're seeing a lot of progress. You're seeing a lot of funding go in. It is actually one of these areas where it has become very classified in recent years, which makes it very difficult, at least as a journalist on the outside, to say, like, are these programs successful? Are they not successful? I don't think we will know for some years. You know, I thought when I finished up the book on DARPA back in 2017, which when I think the writing and research was done in 2016, the, um, their biological technologies office, which actually was again reviving this work on brain computer um, interface, I kind of thought that was gonna be the big area. Uh, at least of investment, hard to say now. I mean, so where goes the Department of Defense? There goes DARPA. So I don't know how much they're focusing on that now. I think less and less. But this question, and this goes to the sort of the artificial intelligence and robotics themes, of, you know, what problem are you trying to solve? And, you know, is that technology capable of solving it? You know, back in the early 1960s, the DARPA program manager who started the program that became ARPANET and the internet, J.C.R. Licklider, he wrote this very famous essay on, on um, man-computer symbiosis. And so J.C.R. Licklider, the godfather of the internet, basically said, I think they're, you know, we're going to get to artificial intelligence someday. I think maybe he thought it was pretty far away. I still have my, you know, I think it may be still pretty far away of true artificial intelligence. But he said, you're going to have this in-between period of you know, what he called man-computer symbiosis, of working seamlessly with machines. That's sort of where his idea of computer networking came out of. So is that brain-computer interface? I don't know. I still think that there's a lot that we don't understand, a lot about the human brain. But could we see usable devices? I think some people are arguing that they're, I don't, I don't think there are things that are particularly useful. But I, I, I think that's the question that when I look to the future, I would ask, what, if you want to know where things are going, what is the national security problem we're trying to solve with artificial intelligence, with brain-computer interface? And if you can kind of solve that one, you have a better idea of where we're going with the technology. Absolutely. I mean, and one of the biggest challenges we face right now is with recruitment, uh, you know, manning levels across the services and, and shortfalls in that regard. So. Uh, I, I certainly think if, if you asked um, anybody at the Pentagon what, what's keeping them up at night, you know, China, Ukraine, and probably uh, recruitment retention, which then leads into how do I build myself an autonomous, you know, fighting robot. Now, I'll let you guys discuss that the next hour when we get to arming artificial intelligence. But the question I wanted to ask was, you know, again, this kind of secret science. Um, so assuming that DARPA is working on sort of these technologies that are presumably secret because we don't know about them yet. Um, you know, as a scientist, uh, secrecy kind of hurts your innovation, right? Being, not being able to freely communicate and listen to other people communicate their ideas uh, and uh, poke holes in your hypotheses and then, and then work really hard to kind of uh, advance and then defend your ideas. I, I wonder if you think that operating in secret as a, as a defense agency, do you think that has held us back at all uh, in, in the defense industry? You know, what I would say, you know, what, what I hear from DARPA um, directors and program officers that I've spoken with is that you, you want to keep something secret if it provides you a capability that's an advantage over an enemy. That would be a justification. I can only speak to what I've seen as a journalist looking at you know, an array of science and technology programs. It, it's possible, it, it's where keeping technology programs classified for that reason I think is a, uh, you know, not whether I personally think, but that's a, a coherent argument that I can buy into. You know, we have a hypersonic technology that gives us a strategic advantage, a tactic, whatever sort of advantage, and we want to keep that secret from our competitors, from our enemies. I think where I've seen programs, a lot of damage uh, done is when science is kept secret. 
because it is, um, first of all, so much at odds with the way science is conducted, of peer review, of publication. So, and this is where it gets into brain-computer interface. There were, um, there was a program at DARPA in the early aughts, in the 2000s, called Augmented Cognition. You may be familiar with it, which was exactly that. You're going to put sensors on people's heads and, you know, give feedback to them. Um, the, the science was just from what I heard from people who worked on it, just a mess. So you, you need to get that out there. One of the most disastrous DARPA projects of all time that we talked a little bit over lunch was back in the 1960s when um, the US government realized that Moscow was irradiating the US embassy in Moscow. This may be familiar to those of you who have followed the Havana syndrome controversy. And the CIA was like, well, why are they doing this? Why are they irradiating the US embassy? And one of the theories at the time in the 1960s was that they were doing this uh, to sort of affect the brains of you know, CIA personnel and embassy workers in the building. And so the CIA asked that, um, eventually got translated down to DARPA, that DARPA start a top secret project to look at the scientific effects of microwaves on the human brain. And you know, this program continued on for five or six years, all in secret, and it took, it, it, it was basically a, a hodgepodge of bad science, of dirty data, there was no baseline set, but no one knew it because it was all conducted in secret. Um, so that, that's where I see the problems, where the science is kept secret, not the technology. Interesting insight, and thanks. I'm sure, uh, I know I'd never heard of the Moscow signal before, but certainly Havana syndrome had been going around the news in the last It year was a so. very parallel thing of sort of, you know, concerns about microwave radiation effects on humans. Actually, the big difference was in, you know, in the 1960s, I think it continued through the early 1970s, was we, we knew, you know, we could detect the microwave radiation. The question was, was it having an effect on personnel? With the Havana syndrome, these US personnel that reported health symptoms out of Havana and then around the world, um, mi microwave radiation was never detected. It was theorized that that would explain the effects on the personnel. And is that that's still un unsolved, right? It's unsolved, and it suffers from some of the same problem that a lot of the data, you know, because the, the patients themselves, um, the initial group were reportedly CIA personnel, so there has been a lot of secrecy around that. Um, I would say it's a similar problem. Interesting. Um, so again, in keeping with secrets, so uh, when conflict does arise, uh, things obviously transpire that are unplanned and new technologies are often divulged uh, sort of uh, in an unplanned manner. The best, ex uh, best example from recent history would be the stealth helicopter during the uh, Bin Laden raid. Uh, hey, we didn't know we had those and there it is on the, on the front page of the, of the paper, right? So of the Wall Street Journal, as it were. Um, and so I'm, you, you're obviously watching what's happening in Ukraine, and I'm wondering, with this sort of near-peer conflict, have we seen any uh, new technologies or new uh, techniques or tactics emerge that uh, before we hadn't thought of or planned for? So, yeah, I mean, so the Ukraine war is, is of course, it's characterized, it's, it's you know, kind of what we think of a, con a, a traditional conventional war. But you do see aspects of technology, actually, that we tried to do in other places like Afghanistan. So I think one example, and again, this was a DARPA program as well. So back at the height of the Afghanistan conflict, DARPA had this idea that they would hand out cell phones uh, to Afghans to help basically do open source crowdsourced intelligence. So Afghans would record where they saw IEDs being placed. All of this information would go back and be mapped, and it would help us basically create a, a, you know, a, a blanket of sensors across, Af across Afghanistan. Um, I think many of you can imagine <laughs> what the challenges were of that, um, that of course, you know, it wasn't that we had a, um, there was not a unified population of support. You know, you were giving cell phones, military cell phones, to people that were, you know, in some cases put in danger by that. There, there were a whole host of problems, and you know, people giving bad data. Um, and you know, the, the, it was certainly an interesting idea. It, it did not work by anybody's account. I think um, the Defense Intelligence Agency wrote in a report that yeah, it was um, a pretty dramatic failure. Um, but what you're seeing in Ukraine is the Ukrainian government has done just that. They have an app where Ukrainians can report where they've seen Russian troop movements. 
um, all sorts of things. That, from what I've heard, um, has been very, very successful. So one of the differences is, of course, you have um, much, much better cell phone penetration in Ukraine. You also have a highly motivated population wanting to work with the government and reporting this data in. But still, the, the idea that that is an example, that's something new, and it goes back to that idea that we have this network of sensors out there, which are humans. I mean, we all, almost all of us carry cell phones. So that, that would be, I think, probably one of the examples I've seen. A another, of course, is, is drones. Um, you know, it, it's interesting. We're seeing drones employed in such different ways um, than perhaps, I mean, certainly different than how the US employed them in places like Iraq and Afghanistan and elsewhere. Um, I think that's one of the things that's also been a defining feature of, of the Ukraine war. And using them, frankly, much more like DARPA was trying to use small armed drones back in Vietnam. It's almost like, um, you know, it's, it's how you use them in that case less than the technology evolution, perhaps. Now, that, interesting, and, and um, drone use on both sides of the conflict yeah. in this case, right? So a thing that we really haven't had to deal with in, in the Iraq and Afghanistan scenario is defending against the drone situation. Have there been any, you know, kind of big advances that have kind of shown up on the battlefield that you've seen in your reporting or? No, you know, I used to, you know, certainly the U.S. has been thinking about counter drone technology for a while, um, using everything from directed energy to, you know, kinetic solutions. Um, I know that the U.S. has pr promised to provide something called the Vampire, which I think is a Harris-produced counter drone system. I kind of, you know, I, um, one of my, the people on my team was going to the big army convention, AUSA in DC, and the one thing I said is like, when I go to a, an, like a, one of the big military shows, what I always look for is like, what do I see a lot of? So I haven't had a chance to talk to him, but I'd be really interested to see, have a lot of companies, are they showing new counter drone solutions? I would expect, based on sort of previous history, that's where you'll start to see a lot of innovation. You know, what do countries do? They study the conflicts that are going on, and they're seeing how small, often cheap drones can be used. So it's, you know, I'm sure they're thinking about um, how to defeat against. I mean, there's things that are out there, of course, like anti, you know, jamming technology, uh, but I'm sure there's a lot of other things being thought about. As, as a fighter pilot, uh, unmanned aerial aircraft are my sworn uh, nemesis, right? Uh, and I would love to jump into that conversation, but I really want to challenge you guys to talk about that at tonight's panel, which is arming artificial intelligence, because I think it's plain to see that you take a drone uh, and you make it truly autonomous and put it in that contested environment to seek and destroy. Uh, you have a very capable and a very lethal weapon, but you also have some serious ethical questions, and I, I, hope, uh, I hope you get in that discussion. If not, I'll, answer, I'll ask the question for sure. Um, but going back to Ukraine, uh, have there been any examples of technology that new technologies that were ineffective, something that we had developed or uh, that someone else perhaps had developed and deployed uh, and brought to this kind of near peer um, conflict that didn't work as, as advertised? Oh, that is a great question. Um, I, you know, I remember there were initially reports of drones. So I think some types of drones that were provided to Ukraine by the West were defeated early on by jamming technology. But as you know, as we've seen, you know, drones as a whole have been successful. Um, I think you know, my opinion, and this probably doesn't bode well for um, a, a DARPA pitch, is that the um, what we're seeing in Ukraine, um, I mean, first of all, that a motivated population really, really makes a difference. Um, I, I think it's, it's not always about advanced technology. I mean, I think when you look at something like HIMARS, it, it is, you know, when you have intelligence plus precision targeting, it can really, really do a lot of damage. But part of what we're seeing are traditional defense issues. You know, do your supply lines work? Can you produce enough bullets? Um, you know, do you have the ability to re-equip forces? Um, that's certainly, um, that's a problem that Russia is facing right now. And it's a problem for Ukraine as well. Um, you know, it, it's a problem, frankly, for the West as well, which is supplying them. Um, you know, we don't have enough air defense systems to provide Ukraine. Um, that's a that's an old-fashioned. That's not a technology problem. That's can you produce enough? Um, and it's something you know that probably the United States needs to look at for its own capabilities. Certainly. Uh, one one more question before I shift away from kind of the, the conflict in Ukraine, and you know it's it, it is an interesting case study because it is a near peer sort of you know 
first world, uh, you know, major militaries kind of going, uh, competing against each other here. Uh, what about the more non-kinetic sort of soft impacts? And, and uh, I want to come at this from the standpoint of innovation, uh, specifically, you know, DARPA and other industries. But when we look at the effects of uh, social media or just the media in general, uh, controlling the flow of information between sides and then amongst their peer groups and then across sort of the front line. What, what effects of technology have you seen or can you comment on in terms of employing AI to say filter messages or censor information or control what's being shared um, and, and the importance of that? I don't know, and maybe it's just because it's not my area of expertise, I don't know that AI has played such a role in it. I could be wrong. It's more what we've seen in the evolution of conflicts going back to um, the, the war, Russia's war in Georgia as well, which is this battle for information um, with disinformation, frankly, on, on, on both sides, um, and also with you know, the popularization on social media. I mean, it's just when you look at what um, Ukraine and to some extent the government there as well has been able to do on social media and, and understanding how important it is for them to kind of wage the battle there, it's interesting. I actually wanted to turn back, I thought of something in your last question about something that we haven't seen work out and pose it more as a question. I think the, the one thing that those of us who watch Ukraine have all been asking since the beginning is why have we not seen sort of the devastating cyber war that many people thought we would see in the Ukraine conflict? You know, the U US has invested in this area, Russia has invested, many countries have invested in this area. So at the beginning of the war, we all expected, uh, all is a little bit hyperbolic, but many of us expected that, that the war would start with sort of a series of cyber attacks that would take out um, you know, Ukrainian infrastructure. We, we didn't see that. We've certainly seen cyber attacks. I don't have the best answer. I think that history is yet to be written, and it's a really, really interesting question to delve into. Is it because these capabilities aren't as useful or as developed as we thought they were? Was there some strategic reason that Russia didn't employ them? Did the US, I mean, we, we do know and suspect that the US has been helping them in a number of areas, certainly to include in the cyber area. Did the US come in and, and protect them in some fashion? Um, we don't know, but I guess we would say that's been an area that has, from face value, hasn't been perhaps as important or dramatic, and maybe it has and it's all in the shadows, but that is a great question for people to delve into in the future or yeah, now. Yeah, fantastic. I think, do we have a question? Please. Yeah, hi, uh, great discussion. Uh, I'm Lyle Goldstein uh, from uh, Brown University and uh, also Defense Priorities. Um, my question is more, you know, broader than DARPA, if you'll permit, um, but I think related, um, you know, I worked for the Navy for 20 years and I, you know, one clear trend, I think this might be true in the other services, is this uh, tendency in military indu industry toward uh, kind of gold plating, you know, uh, putting you know putting every bell and whistle on the system so that it's it's uh, you know exquisite but uh, so complex that it's difficult to operate and and the Navy has really struggled. I don't know if you're aware, but with the uh, littoral combat ship, uh, basically among specialists viewed as a total failure, and the, uh, also the Zumwalt destroyer, which gets a shout out in, in the Ghost Fleet book, but unfortunately, most naval analysts consider the entire surface fleet to be in huge, huge trouble. Um, and uh, I don't know, you know, maybe it's not as bad in the other services, but, uh, you know, in some ways, drones appear to be kind of a solution, right? I mean, they're relatively cheap, we could produce them in mass numbers and, and get us out of this uh, bad situation. So I wonder kind of what your impression of that is, is, has this been alleviated to some degree? And by the way, not to drag out this point, but the Navy force structure, you know, I think they're constantly shooting for something like, uh, what is it, um, 400 ships or something like that. And dreaming of the 1980s when we had 600, but I think now we're trying to kind of square the circle by saying, you know, well, we'll get to 400, but a quarter of them will probably be unmanned, you know, and, and so I wonder 
you know, do you have any thoughts for military leadership? I mean, that's an extraordinary decision to make when you're saying a quarter of your force structure are going to be unmanned um, without any of them having been tested in combat. So your thoughts? You know, I always say I only know as much as the last person I interviewed. Um, <clears throat> it's sort of, your question reminds me of back in, um, you know, when I first started covering a lot of defense industry issues for a defense trade publication back in the early 2000s. And, you know, this was when unmanned aerial vehicles, drones, were, were first becoming very, you know, we're first sort of entering warfare. I mean, now we think we almost take it for granted, but it was very new. And Congress mandated in one of the, one of the defense authorization bills, I think of 2000 or 2003, that by, by 2020, one third of, um, you know, army ground vehicles are gonna be unmanned. Um, anybody know what percentage that is today? I'm guessing 0 0.1. Um, so, I think uh, in that case, it was more of a technology problem. It turns out that it's much easier in, you know, to go around in the air with a drone than it is on the ground where you have all sorts of objects. And this, in this case, it's, you know, I think what, what the Navy is facing is, is a procurement challenge and, and a leadership challenge. I mean, they have to make that decision. They have to decide what they, you know, how, what their fleet should look like, uh, what should be the mix. Um, I, it's, it's an area I haven't followed that much over the past few years, but I don't hear those decisions, those hard decisions being made. Certainly there's probably scholars of the Navy out there that could answer better than me wh why that, wh what, what is going wrong there that those decisions aren't being made. That's the part I, I, I don't know. But you know, it, it, it would take a major decision and, and um, those are hard in the Pentagon. I think the, the easiest way to put that back in, a, in the form of a question is, um, would you get on an airplane to fly home that didn't have any pilots sitting in the front? I'm sure there's some people here who would, and there's probably a lot of people who'd say, I don't know if we're quite there yet. And if you're not willing to sit in the airplane to, with no pilots up front to take you home, understandably, uh, if you were to put our entire national security posture under that same context of uh, armed vehicles that are essentially uh, roving the perimeter or, or you know, flying as your wingmen in combat, um, that, that's a big leap of faith, and I, I'm not sure that the technology is there yet uh, in terms of relying wholly on drones to fill that need, but I, I, think, it's, I think we're moving towards that. Yeah. Uh, I think they'd like to get there. I mean, what's interesting for me is I've been, you know, when this question of AI and ethics kind of took, came to the forefront a few years ago, I was always sort of mystified from it because I always look at it from the opposite standpoint, like the congressional you know, mandate back in 2002. So many of the things that I saw being predicted back in the early 2000s are, are not, you know, we have taking pilots out of the cockpit. You know, it's actually the small drones that are being used mostly on the battlefield. It, it, it's, surpri it's surprising, things don't always go where you imagine them. I think science fiction is wonderful and it can provide blue, it can provide ideas for the future, but it's rarely a blueprint in, in my view. Yes, please. I, um, sorry to go back to uh, Ukraine, but it's about drones. Ukraine is, the, and a lot of the drones in Ukraine have been used for uh, mainly surveillance because they don't have any like big drones like Predators and such in the, U in the US, but it's also been used for like fuel, like spotting for artillery. Do you think that drones are gonna have more of like a kinetic future or more of surveillance because like a human can't have a thermal vision essentially, but drones can. And do, what do you think about like the future of that, like the surveillance and with like battle damage reporting with like missile strikes as with HIMARS and because you need BDR after attacks. And like sometimes like Russia's has problems, like they've taken up two to three days in order to get BDR and another attack on a target after a failed attack. So how does that, do you see drones as that future or do you see them more moving towards uh, Connecticut and like being like the weapon at the front. Are you talking about Ukraine or more broadly in the future? Just like what we've seen in Ukraine and then how that's gonna affect the future. So I think it's gonna depend on the conflict. I mean, that's what's been so interesting to watch, um, you know, how drones are being employed. Um, you know, so in a lot of cases, so, you know, they, they are, I think one of the things that I've seen reported is that you know, that they have gotten frustrated. They can, you know, buy Chinese drones cheaper and, you know, they have good engineers there and equip them with cameras for surveillance and do a lot of things that don't necessarily require advanced technology. Sometimes it's cheapness. So I think it's, it's gonna depend on, 
you know, where they're going to be used and how they're going to be used. I mean, I think back in the, in the 2000s going up to, you know, 2009, 10, and 11, you know, as a reporter, I thought, okay, there's going to be the predator, and then there's going to be the replacement for them. And there was. There was a program to replace the predator, and we're going to be going towards more drones that are armed. And that's not necessarily how the whole world is going. Um, you know, you had uh, Houthis in Yemen using, you know, effectively drones very effectively. I think it's, it, it's, it's going to depend on the conflict, and I think it will evolve in ways that we didn't expect. You know, human ingenuity is um, amazing, if nothing else. I don't know if that answers your question. <laughs> yeah, and another question. Do you see the future of um, like personnel warfare moving towards more towards urban and underground because of the prevalence of drones in the air? I don't think so. I don't think so. Um, I don't, uh, I just haven't seen any movement towards that. <laughs> Thank you. And uh, we have time for one more question, please, sir. Thank you. Um, I really appreciate hearing some of your comments about what I would call a technological blind spot or a, a tendency to overbet on a particular tech because AI was, if you go back to the 50s, since the 50s everybody's been saying, oh, in another 20 years, this is what's going to be happening. And it's taken 70 years and considerable advancement to get to the point where we've got mass computing and, and uh, network availability of data to have some of this actually coming to the fore. And so the question I've got for you is what's, what's the other technological, I don't know, blind spot or the sexy tech that we're oversold on that we think is going to change the future when in fact there are other solutions, you know, the, as you said, what's the problem you're trying to solve? What's, what's the tech going, what tech do you have that's going to help you solve that? Or is the tech you're working with going to solve that? Are we, are we over betting on a particular technology and hoping something will spill out of it like it did from the space program or from DARPA in uh, investigations into other tech? Uh, are we oversold on something? Or do you know of or see a particular blind spot for us in the future that we should be bringing into that space that we think about for you know, AI in the battlefield? We're sold on AI and robots for this particular seminar, but is there something else we're not thinking about? We are oversold on AI and undersold on the importance of humans. I remember back in, I think around 2009, 2010, when there was a lot of investment before the current sort of hype over AI, a lot of DOD investment was being made in computational social science, trying to track, you know, where will the next IED attack be in Afghanistan, mixing in quantitative data on IED attacks with social data on Taliban influence, price of oranges, all sorts of unusual stuff. And I remember interviewing um, back at, the, what was the organization called JIDO, the Joint IED Defeat Task Force Organization. I'm, I'm mixing up what the uh, full, it was the bomb fighting agency. And I remember interviewing the chief scientist there who was in charge of running this investment in kind of what you might call nascent AI. Can we come up with programs that will predict the next IED attack and save lives? And sort of like towards the end of the interview, he just starts kind of ad-libbing, I mean, in, in a thoughtful way. And he said, you know what, you know, the Taliban are beating us, and they're beating us without the computers, without the technology, without the science, and they're beating us. Um, and I think we oversold ourselves on technology and undersold ourselves on the ability to um, deal with human beings. I think, you know, Russia might learn that same lesson. Sorry. In, um, in Ukraine, it's the same thing there. Well put. Well, with that, we are out of time, so I'd like to uh, extend a very special thank you uh, to Sharon. Please join me in giving a round of applause. Thank you, it's a real pleasure to be here.